What's up guys? Welcome back to the Home Slice and welcome back to the Sharpening Shack. I have an episode that's been brewing on my mind for quite some time. This is going to be a metallurgy episode, particularly looking at the compositions of different steels. So if you're into steel and you love nerding out about the steel that's inside of knives and the technology and the composition and the alloys that go into that, this is probably going to be a great episode for you. If you're not, then you might not enjoy this one so much, but let's buckle up and talk about steel. Now, the reason why I wanted to do this episode is because you hear a lot of comparisons made and you hear people talking about like, oh, well, this steel is kind of vaguely like this other steel that I've used before. I'm not here to say that I know tons and tons and tons about steel or metallurgy. I'm no, I'm no scientist. I'm no metallurgist. But as I go along, I do from time to time see fads come through or see some sort of glaring and obvious misconceptions about the composition of metal. So to be clear, heat treatment is really, really important for knife performance, but you can't really put alloys in or pull alloys out with heat treatment. The alloys sort of give you this template that you can either utilize really, really well and get a high performance version of that steel, or you can utilize poorly and get a low performance version of that steel. So not all of the things that I will say will pertain across all models because a very well heat treated version of one steel might outperform a really poorly heat treated version of a steel that is naturally better in some respect, meaning better in toughness or wear resistance. But we're going to try to tackle some misconceptions today. Okay, first off, AEBL. There's a lot of hype and a lot of excitement around this steel called Bowler AEB-L. Now, if you see a custom knife made in this, or even a non-custom knife made in this, people tend to get really excited about this steel these days. And there's there's facts thrown around, like the fact that the microstructure is naturally really small. The grain uh, structure of the steel and the carbides are naturally like sometimes below one, a micron or something like that if it's heat treated decently. And so you see videos of people getting decent performance out of AEBL and it's it seems quite exciting. Well, those of you, this is sort of like an easy one, but those of you who are into metallurgy or at least steel composition will be familiar with the fact that AEBL, which is this, I'll throw up a graph. This is the composition by mass, by the weight of the elements that are put in it of AEBL. It's pretty much another name for Sandvik 13C26. Now, that's old news for a lot of you guys, but if it's not old news for you, I would cause you to consider, like, why do we get so excited about AEBL, and yet we think of Sandvik steels as, like, a budget option that's not very good. I'd recommend, if you are getting into knives, to get the knife steel app for your phone because you can quickly quickly reference through these different compositions of steels and see which ones are actually the same and then what it comes down to is manufacturing and heat treat so aebl is undoubtedly a really cool steel what many people don't realize most people think that steel like 420 hc is like a real rock bottom budget steel that if heat treated well can be decent but then they ascribe these godlike qualities to AEBL. And here's a graph right here of AEBL beside 13C26 beside 420HC. <laughs> and you will note that they're almost all exactly the same. <laughs> the main problem that you see rising from these steels is that the carbon on 420HC is a little bit lower. And I will say, okay, that little bit does matter. There's also a little bit less manganese in it. So there's a little bit less alloy, a little bit less carbon. That does matter because at this threshold of carbon from 0.45 to 0.65% carbon, every little bit does count. So from 0.45 to 0.65 is a 50% increase.
So that is significant. It does affect the hardening threshold and how hard you can get the steel and the performance that you can get there. But I would also say I would be cautious to automatically prescribe these amazing qualities to AEBL and automatically assume that 420HC is subpar when they're essentially the same steel with a slightly different carbon content and a slightly different hardenability. Does that make sense? Another steel that is really kind of a buzzword these days is Nitro V. Civivi Knives is doing a lot with Nitro V and it has the ring of like a new steel that has come into the knife industry. And I love Nitro V. I, I sent a custom knife in Nitro V, which I'm dying to test, but I got to get my sharpening protocol dialed in first. And I've had really good experiences with Nitro V. This is a side by side of a graph of AEBL next to Nitro V. And you can see that they're very, very, very similar. And so you could expect a lot of the good things that you get from AEBL to be present in Nitro V. In Nitro V, you've added just a little bit of nitrogen, which does help with that hardening threshold or the, the way that the steel hardens. And you've got a little bit more alloy in that you've got a bit more manganese in there and some trace elements that you might not have in AEBL. And you could look at this graph and draw the conclusion like, oh, AEBL and Nitro V are similarly awesome. Like anytime I see those, they're going to have similar characteristics. They're both going to be really awesome. But I'm going to flick you over to another graph. This is AEBL and Nitro V with the addition of 14C28N. Now, most of you, if you've been in the knife community for a while, you've been hearing about 14C28N since Kershaw was using it at a pretty poor hardness level sometimes in their folders, and it's become a bit run of the mill to you. And now I will say, okay, 14C28N has a little bit more chrome in it, so it will have some differing abilities and characteristics. But what's funny to me is that these two steels, which are really like popular and they're kind of a uh, becoming a little bit of a fad in some ways in circles that I talk to, if you place them against the sort of plain Jane 14C28N that we've had around forever, they're very, very, very similar. And I think this means a couple of things. This means that if we were to see companies heat treating Sandvik steel really, really well, we would see similar performance to what we see in the customs with AEBL and Nitro V. And I would just encourage you guys to sort of like lobby for that and sort of like start good discussions around heat treatment because oftentimes we don't need a new steel to get better performance. It's just that some of the hardening protocols and the heat treatments are a bit sloppy. And if the consumers call for better heat treatment, we could get some phenomenal performance out of these Sandvik steels. The other thing that I would say is just don't get too carried away. Don't get too carried away with the fads and be paying tons and tons and tons of money for Nitro V or AEBL over something like 420HC when really, or 14C28N, when really there's a, a lot of similarity between the two. Like spend your money where it counts. If you can get a better heat treat of 14C28N, then go with that over like Civivi Nitro V because you know, manufactured versus custom, the heat treatment is going to play a bigger role than that 1% of chrome. That's just my two cents on that. We'll move on to carbon steel. Okay, when we come to carbon steel, I want to talk about 80CRV2. Now, you guys see me throw that up and you'll think of these Veristelica blades like the Yakari Puko, or whatever it's pronounced, um, or the Tarava Skrama. And the Dutch bushcraft boys have sort of put these on the map a little bit more because they're from this Finnish website, I believe, Varastelica. And they make these almost indestructible blades. So you'll see the DBK boys shooting them with bullets and batoning them through the hardest wood ever and frying pans and, and whatnot. So 
ADCRV2 has sort of come to have this air of like, this is the indestructible steel, like you cannot break this stuff. I'm gonna throw up a little graph of the composition of this steel right now. Now, just for sizing and scaling reference, this is it next to AEBL, which we were just talking about. And so you can see that, although in that first graph, the differences look really large, we're actually looking at kind of smaller differences between those alloys. It's just blown out of proportion because there's no chrome in it to make a large bar, which scales the whole thing down. Hopefully that makes sense to you. So ADCR V2 is thought to be sort of this indestructible, like almost like spring steel stuff. And I'm going to put up on the screen right now ADCR V2 next to the old Carbon 5 that Cold Steel used to use. The reason I'm doing this is you can see that Carbon 5's got a little less alloy, but it sort of makes sense for them to be in that similar category. They've got pretty similar composition lines there. And you can see that they both would be really low alloy steels, which are likely to have good toughness. This is where a little bit of a wrench gets thrown into your mentality though, because this is ADCR V2 next to 1095 Crovan. 1095 Crovan again has become this run of the mill thing. It's like, oh, it's, you know, K Bar uses it, a few people use it, and it's decent middle range steel. It's, you know, the Charpy testing. I'll try to get a picture of a Charpy test to show you where the placement of 1095 is on it. So the Charpy testing doesn't show 1095 to be that tough, and sometimes people don't get super excited about it, but ADCRV2 is much more similar to 1095 Crovan in alloys than it is to Carbon 5, and it pretty much is a similar pattern with just a little bit more nickel, more silicon, more molybdenum, just a little bit. And 1095 Crovan has a bit of a higher carbon content. Now I should mention that there is a large gulf of performance in terms of toughness between ADCR V2, you can see it up here, around 30 foot-pounds of toughness, and 1095 in the Knife Steel Nerds testing. And there is a big difference in the toughness but it should be noted that the 1095 that's being tested on Knife Steel Nerds is regular 1095. The reason they've actually added chrome and vanadium to 1095 Crovan is to increase the toughness. It soaks up a little bit of the carbon and leaves less of the carbon in the solution of the steel, and that results in a better form of martensite being formed. You could probably expect the toughness of 1095 Crovan to be somewhere in between, in this gulf between 10 foot-pounds around and 30 foot-pounds. Basically, if there's more than 0.6% carbon in the steel itself, it forms plate martensite or begins to form it, which is much less tough. If you want to learn more, I'll put a link in the description below to the article where Laren discusses this phenomenon. But I just want to show you this to get you thinking. There's not these light years, light years of difference between ADCRV2 and 1095 Crovan, even though we think of them in distinct and separate ways very, very often. They're very close to being the same thing, and with an excellent heat treat, they could both be either very tough, or they could be hardened very well. So there you have it. That's just my perspective on some common carbon steels, and as I would think of it, ADCR V2 is an awesome steel. It's not a spring steel, I guess I would say. It's not 5160. It's not something that has this really low carbon content where you could just make springs out of the stuff. It's actually closer to the stuff that K-Bar is using. Well, I reckon this video is probably long enough covering some of those common stainless steels and carbon steels that carry a sort of connotation or perhaps a reputation that is maybe not entirely accurate in relationship with each other. I'll probably end this video there and I will put out another episode that is about tool steel because I think we think some equally silly thoughts about tool steel and I would love to throw a wrench in your thoughts 
and make you think through the way that you think about tool steel a little bit as well. But for now, I'll just say, hey, peace out from the home slice. You guys take care of yourselves. Bye.